Hello, thank you so much for having me today. Um, my name is Julie Masura, and I am a researcher and associate teaching professor in environmental science at the University of Washington Tacoma. Um, I appreciate you inviting me to do this doc talk. As you can tell, you know, I'm not on a doc, but I am going to talk. And I'm going to talk about plastic pollution in the ocean for just a, a few minutes with you today. It's kind of appropriate if you think about it, because this is kind of Earth Month. Earth Day is um, April 22nd, and um, plastic pollution is a pretty um, well-known topic and, and kind of an issue that we need to confront um, as people that live on Earth. So, um, so I'll talk to you a little bit about how I got involved in the research how the research kind of evolved over time, how I developed this really cool partnership with Sound Experience, um, and then maybe end up with a little bit of kind of hints or ideas and way in which we can reduce our plastic pollution, or not plastic pollution, but plastic use uh, in our um, lives. So as I mentioned, there's a lot of plastic that's being manufactured, and plastics are important. They were used, they are basically developed, these polymers were developed to essentially um, replace or uh, natural resources made, made they were developed to last for a long period of time have long time applications um, which makes sense you know if we use them and they're being applied and they're being used for a long period of time and they don't go anywhere and they're functioning well um, that makes sense but if we continue to create these single-use plastics it's kind of overkill and um, single-use plastic probably not necessary, um, and we throw it away, we're going to continue to build this, this um, waste. And that plastic waste, we would hope, would get into our waste stream and, and go directly into our wherever uh, the end point will be. But unfortunately, it leaks out. And up to 5% of all of that plastic has the potential to make its way towards the ocean. Um, so that's kind of how I got involved in this plastics research. So in 2008, the University of Washington Tacoma hosted an international workshop on plastic, or actually marine debris, trying to understand um, what we knew and what we didn't know about plastic pollution in the ocean. And from that meeting, it was discovered that we kind of got the big stuff. We can quantify that stuff that made a lot of sense, but we didn't understand the small stuff. And so that's where the definition of a microplastic was officially defined. So a microplastic is anything from the width of a skinny pencil, five meters on down. I have a, um, a, an end point, a lower point that I do my work with, and I talk about the width of a pin, um, which is about 330 microns, um, and that's kind of the mesh of the, the net that I use to do my sampling. So it was from that conference that, you know, the scientists wanted to understand how much plastic was in the ocean. Obviously, that's too much, right? So we can't figure out that. There's a lot of ocean out there. But what we really wanted to do is find out ways in which we can develop some methods to sample in the environment and then analyze in the labs. We can concentrate those plastics, identify them, and be able to kind of communicate how much plastic is in the ocean through potential modeling, right? So. Um, it was at that time where, um, when, when I was involved, I became involved in this research question, how much plastics in the ocean? And so a group of um, colleagues of mine, other professors, uh, research scientists, undergraduate students and graduate students all got together and we tried to figure it out. We tried to figure out ways in which we could collect environmental science, or samples and then determine if there is plastic in those samples. And so it was through a bunch of creative and really exciting and thrilling kind of discussions and trials and errors, made a lot of errors, that's another whole nother story, um, in which we came up with pretty sound methods for quantifying large volumes of water. And we use the Puget Sound or the Salish Sea at the time, but this can be applied all over the world, where we can take large volumes of water, do a, some analyses in the lab, and be able to come, with, uh, come up with a pretty good estimation on the amount of polymers or plastics that are in those samples. And that was pretty cool. The methods were um, published uh, by NOAA, and people use those methods throughout the world. And I talked to people 
all over the world about ways in which they can kind of um, incorporate those methods into their research. In fact, I just finished an email before I started this podcast, or not podcast, but talk, um, with somebody from India who he's pretty close to finishing up his work, which I think is pretty cool. So in 2011, I was contacted by two staff members from Sound Experience. And they said, hey, Julie, I would love to come over and talk to you and, and learn a little bit about your research. And I'm like, cool, <laughs> come on over. So we sat in my cubicle at the, at the time I was at the Center for Urban Waters. And I basically gave them a one hour lecture on the work that I did. And they seemed pretty engaged. They seemed kind of excited. They they really had a lot of great questions that, you know, normally I think my friends would think I was really nerding out. Um, but they were nerding out with me, which was great. And after that conversation, they, they said, you know, we want to figure out ways in which we can support your research. We want to do some real research on the beautiful ship, The Adventurous, during our programming to be able to support your research and be able to get the more of the community involved in your work. And I'm like, okay. So that was kind of my introduction to, to community service. Um, and so it was a little bit later that, uh, maybe a month later, maybe a couple weeks later, I was on the ship, the Adventurous, and I had this wonderful Captain Josh <laughs> um, took me out and he sailed around the commencement bay near Tacoma. Um, and we tested it out. I brought my sampling equipment. Um, I had some undergraduates with me and we deployed um, my research net off the back of the Adventurous and that became our began our partnership. Where now we have, and I calculated this the other day, about a thousand people have been serviced or actually have been educated on plastic pollution using um, instrumentation and discussion through activities as, a rot as an educational rotation on a ship's program. That can be from communities all the way to, to um, first graders or third graders. And I think that's so cool. And it seems to me that when people talk about plastic pollution, they're pretty engaged and they want to figure out solutions. So we do um, marine debris education on the ship Adventures, and that makes so much sense. Our mission is really to understand ways in which we can lessen the impact of humans uh, uh, on our marine environment, how we can learn to respect the marine environment. Um, and so many students um, just really seem to, to get it. And even just community members uh, really get it. I wanted to back up and talk and tell a quick story. So I remember um, kind of vaguely when I was getting more involved with Sound Experience um, that they were applying for a grant through Ben and Jerry's to an environmental grant because, you know, Ben and Jerry's ice cream, you know, they love to support environmental education and research. And so they applied for this grant and the corporation and they didn't get it, but they, which was kind of a bummer because uh, it seemed like a no brainer. But what happened was is the... Um, the franchise owner, owners from here in the Puget Sound, they said, you know what? We didn't give you the grant, but we want to pay for your research equipment. And so Ben and Jerry's actually bought the research equipment that we use on the Adventurous and for Sound Experiences programs. Um, and I think that's really cool. And they're really committed and still are committed, of course, to environmental issues. So. So again, I said, you know, we've served over, I've estimated about over a thousand people specifically looking at marine debris, uh, which is really cool. Um, and it's really has engaged other, other um, students to kind of talk about this and make these kind of their priorities um, when they do their kind of independent study and their research. Um, I've been contacted a number of times with seniors that have done this work and said, hey, I want to make this my senior project. Um, I have seen um, some of the participants go into college and call me back and say, hey, I'm really interested in doing some of this um, marine debris research. And I think that is so cool. If anything, it made those students aware um, of their impact on the environment, but it also engaged them and really motivated them to seek out maybe trying to under or to support the marine debris research, understanding not only where it is and why it's out there, but the impact on the environment. Before a couple, two more things I wanted to point out before I stop today. Um, 
One thing is that I always want to highlight one of my favorite programs that Sound Experience. Um, I feel like this is a commercial, but <laughs> um, one of my favorite programs is something that we do called Girls in the uh, Girls at the Helm. So it's an all-female crew from the engineer to the deckhands. Uh, we invite research scientists, mentors um, from uh, STEAM, science, technology, uh, engineering, arts, and mathematics. And we also have some maritime, uh, uh, fabulous maritime uh, mentors on the ship. And we basically talk about whatever our specialty is. And I start, I joined the program in 2011, and I've been on every year um, myself or maybe one of my undergraduate research students have been on the ship teaching about marine debris and engaging girls. Um, and from that program, you know, it's a, it's a three-day cruise. Uh, we talk about many things, but one of the one of the small education components is marine debris, and that seems to be kind of a really exciting uh, topic. And we get the girls are handling equipment, and they're you know they're um, recording data, they're looking at our environmental samples, and really understanding what it takes to do primary research. And I think that's great. And it's and I just recently received. Um, Oh, a graduation card that said, "Hey, Julie, I just want to let you know I'm going to I'm going to, to college and I'm going to be pursuing a STEM or a STEM major." And I think that's great. And hopefully, they'll be motivated to do microplastics. Um, and I always say, if you ever need some advice or some mentoring and some research, you can always come to my lab. Um, so that's really cool, and that's one of the greatest missions, I think, of Sound Experience is getting everybody on the ship and understanding about some their impact on the environment. The last thing I wanted to talk about before I close today is, is what can you do, um, and, and how can we prevent plastic from getting to the ocean? Well, I think the number one thing to do to prevent plastic from getting into the ocean is to stop using plastic. But my glasses are plastic, and I, you know, if you look behind me, the the picture that you can't see very well, that's actually the adventurous. It has a huge ugly glare, but that's got a plastic cover. Um, plastics are everywhere, but here's what you can do. Okay, here's what you can do: use less. You know, the best way to reduce plastic pollution is to not use plastic. Okay, there's a wonderful uh, pledge called Plastic Free July. Just Google that. And there's a really neat, um, it's really simple um, organization, or not simple, there's an organization that actually has pledged and gotten millions of people all over the planet to pledge to have a plastic-free July. But one of their, their, met, or, um, their missions or one of their mottos or their approaches is not to re get rid of all plastic, but just make a conscious effort to reduce, right? Stop using plastic lids. Don't use plastic straws. Does it really does it really hurt just to tip your cup? Is it that hard to do that? You know, um, other things about you know utensils and you know if you use a plastic fork, save it, use it a couple of times, right? <laughs> and then if it breaks, then that's a good time to get rid of it, but not just once. So think about ways in which you can either, if you decide and still choose to use plastic things, which I do, just make it last much longer, much much longer. Bring in a, a canvas bag to the grocery store. It's not that hard, and it's something that you really can do. So I just want to thank you guys so much for uh, inviting me to do this dock talk. I wish I was on the dock. I hope to be on that dock pretty soon and on the beautiful ship, The Adventurous. Um, and I hope that I can meet you um, and, and be able to talk to you more about marine debris. If you guys have any questions or any comments, feel free to put them um, here for on this posting. But also, if you want to contact me, feel free to contact Sound Experience and they'll connect you with me. So thank you again so much for having me and have a wonderful and beautiful Earth Month. Take care.